Uh, so I, I was the backup speaker for Utah JS and uh, they didn't end up needing my talk and I had already prepared it so I figured I'll just record it, throw it out here and so you can listen to it if you want. But um, my talk is about how you can allow your users to code, um, how we can build programming languages for our users to use. And that when I say users, it can be your end users, it could be you know, business to business users, it can be internal users. Um, there's a lot of different people that can code that have the, the capability to write logic, but don't necessarily know how to write code. And we can make that possible for them. So a lot of businesses run into the same problem as they scale, as they grow, you have a lot of new customers that you're bringing on and those customers will have very diverse customization needs and um, that becomes the constant demand on most software is that people want to customize it specific to their needs so let's just imagine that we work at um, a company that's something like stripe or shopify it it's a company that provides a checkout for um, retailers to use so in this case uh, most of our customers have very simple business logic needs so in the case of Tom's top hats, for example, um, every hat just has a fixed price. So somewhere in our code, we're going to have um, the, some code here that walks through the checkout or walks through all the items in the cart. It will add them all together by their price and give you back a total. So it's a very simple calculation for uh, this, uh, this cart and this checkout. But um, let's say we're trying to bring on new business, we're trying to scale, there's a new customer that we really want to win, it's a really big flower retailer, um, but they have some specific needs that we don't support. So the, each of their flowers has a fixed price, but um, they try to get rid of their inventory at the end of the week. And so if you order flowers on Saturday, you get a discount off of your whole cart. Um, so in this case, you know, the, the simplest shortcut in order to support something like this is we, we could create something of a feature flag that we enable for fancy flowers, where we check if, you know, cheaper if ordered on Saturday, if this flag is enabled, and then we do some calculations. So we add this into our code. Um, but let's say they come back and they say, you know, actually, Delaware uh, is more expensive for us to ship to because of some regulation and so if if somebody's in Delaware we want to charge them more um you know or maybe they come back and they say actually we need to provide a discount if you're ordering things from the same warehouse because it's a lot cheaper for us to ship something like that now as you can see here on the right we can keep adding this into our code but as you can already imagine that's going to become a nightmare for us to manage if we do that, yes, we can support more complex logic, but that kind of code is very brittle. And we're suddenly now, we're responsible for maintaining all of our customers' business logic, which obviously we don't want to do as we're scaling. And we've greatly increased the surface area for potential bugs. There's a lot more code, there's a lot more places that things can go wrong. And because we've written all this code, that code now needs to be delivered to everybody. Even though, you know, only Fancy Flowers is using this logic, that code is still in the code for everybody. And it's, it's a lot bigger, your, your uh, code is going to be slower to download, that sort of thing. So the next evolution of this, and this is something I see really frequently um, with companies that start to run into this problem and decide we need to provide an additional uh, level of logic, an additional customization option. Uh, I've seen a lot of UIs that look very similar to this, where you have kind of a linear list of if statements where you might um, have like some select boxes, you, you build up an if statement, and then if that matches, you have like a then statement, um, something like that, a very simple sort of list. This can work for a lot of apps, something like this, but uh, there's kind of some pros and cons to it. So pros, we, we have abstracted our logic now into JSON and out of our code, which is great. That's a great step in the right direction. And we also have a more flexible UI than what we had before where the coders, the developers were the ones that were responsible for putting that logic into code. But 
using this kind of interface, we have to make a few assumptions about the kind of logic that users want to write because it's a little bit limited. We actually can't model all types of logic through this kind of linear list. It's very difficult to do combinations of ands and ors, to do loops, to do switch statements, anything, um, a lot of things that you would do in a normal programming language are very difficult to model in that kind of interface. So there's an entire industry that has already solved this problem, and that is the gaming and graphics industry. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar, at least with at least one of these programs, maybe seen it, heard of it. Um, one thing that is similar between all these programs is they all have an interface that looks something like this. So this is a node editor. Um, a node editor is a way to describe logic in a visual uh, way. <clears throat> and this is, this is a screenshot out of Blender. And Blender has a node editor for describing textures and shaders and things that you would use for 3D graphics. But uh, when you look at this, there's actually, it, it looks very similar to a data structure that it's actually represented by under the hood. And that is a graph. Um, so graphs are actually very easy to represent in JSON. It's a very simple, um, it's a very simple data structure. We can see over here on the left, we have a basic graph here. Um, there are nodes that contain data, and then there are associations between those nodes, and we would refer to those as edges. Um, over on the right here, we can see this JSON is very easy. It's very easy to represent this, uh, this multi-dimensional graph data structure in JSON. And you're actually already using graphs, even if you don't realize that you are. Anytime you write code, for example, JavaScript code, um, your JavaScript code is actually converted into a graph before it's processed and parsed and run in a browser. It actually converts it first into what's called an AST, or an abstract syntax tree. So here's an example of an abstract syntax tree. Um, it takes all the tokens from the code that you've written, it converts them into this tree, and it figures out the uh, relationships between each token. So graphs are a great way for us to represent um, logic, because any kind of logic can be modeled with a graph. And when we model our logic with a graph, we can focus on the capabilities of our app and not their specific implementation. And I'll, I'll explain that a little more in a bit. Um, we can we can build these graphs using an interface um, like a node editor that represents a graph visually and it's a very highly customizable UI and when we store logic in this kind of format it's also very easily portable and that can be very useful when we're trying to share our logic between different environments and different layers in our stack So I have a project that I've worked on, um, it's, it's called Flume, and my, uh, my point here today isn't just to hawk this library. I think it's, it's pretty good, and it solves this problem, but it, there are a lot of principles in it that if you want to you know, take this on your own and implement this in your own way, um, hopefully this is still useful to you. So Flume, what Flume does is it solves this problem. It gives you the ability to create a node editor. This is an example of the Flume node editor, and this is actually live. Um, so you can see I can move these around. I can uh, create relationships between different nodes. I can right click here and I've got a bunch of nodes that I can pick from and I can add. And what I can do here is I can describe some fairly complex logic using some nodes. Now, um, Flume doesn't actually ship with any of these nodes. You configure this yourself. Flume is just the library that makes it easy to, um, to render out this node editor. And then it also has an engine for you to run the logic that you model in this node editor. Um, so the JSON that you get out of that graph looks something like this. It's, it, this is similar to what we looked at before, but if we zoom in here, we can see that each of these little objects here really just represent a single node. And the important thing is that each of them have a type key that will be important later, I'll show you. 
and they also understand how they're connected to the other nodes in the graph. And last, nodes can hold data themselves, and so that there's a place in this node that it holds data. So if we come back to our fictional companies here, we've got Tom's Top Hats, this retailer that they, they just have very simple needs, so we can model the logic for calculating their checkout very simply. We have a node here that's a cart, and the cart provides two handy things. It provides the sum of all the items in the cart and the number of items that are in the cart. And so all we want to do for them, and this would be for most of our customers, is we would just hook this up here. We could just have this by default that it's already hooked up. But this is the calculation for the majority of our customers that we would take the sum of the items and we would port it into the total price. So you can see over here that we have, um, this is actually live. So if I pull this off, you can see it goes to zero. And if I pop it back in, it's now calculating. Um, we don't have to do anything else for this customer, but our, our other customer, they had those very specific needs. Um, in the case of, let's say they wanted something to be cheaper on a Saturday um, or a Friday, we'll say a Friday because today's a Friday. So I have here a time node that I can add in that will give me what the current day is. Then I've created a day of the week equals node where I can plug in the current day and I can pair it to test if it's Friday. And then I get back, this will be a, a Boolean. And everything in Flume is type safe. So these ports here, you can see that this blue port can only be plugged into other blue ports because they represent a certain data type, in this case a Boolean. But I can't plug it into the red, but the red plugs into the red. So it's a very safe environment for um, people who aren't super familiar with concepts about type safety or coding or data types, things like that. They can still write code in a way that's very, very safe. Um, I have a number switch here that will take in the result of this day of the week equals and then if that result is true we'll have a certain number and if it's false we'll have a certain number so if it isn't friday then we just want to use the sum of the items but if it is friday then we want we want to take the sum of the items and we'll subtract out um, you know twenty dollars or something you get a discount and we'll pop this into here so now you can see immediately over here in our checkout, um, this should total up to 150, except because it's Friday, it's already, it's already running this logic in this little React component here. And it's figured out that because today is Friday, it needs to flow into this other path and subtract 20 out with this node. If I were to change this to a different day, say Thursday, you can see that we no longer satisfy that condition and we're back to 150. So you can see that already we've, we've written some relatively complicated logic, something that's very one-off that we wouldn't necessarily want to put directly into our code. But because we've modeled it this way, we now have a JSON graph that just represents this logic. So let's dig a little deeper into how exactly this works. So if you want to create a node editor in Flume, all you need to do is import a Flume config. So the Flume config allows you to add and configure those port types and those node types. If we come back and look at this graph real quick, we can see that a node has a specific type. A cart, for example, is a specific type. This add is a specific type of node. Um, and nodes have either inputs or outputs or both, and that they um, there are rules about what kinds of ports they are. So in this, in this case, these are both numbers. This one is a Boolean. You can do strings. You can do anything you want, really. You define those port types yourself. So you add those port types here. We'll say we're going to create a port type that's a number. We're going to say that this port will appear red and that it will have a number control associated with it. There are a bunch of controls that Flume will give you by default that you can work with um, for these standard HTML controls that are styled well. Um, but there are custom controls that you can, you can render whatever you want, really. So we've added this port type, so now let's use it to make a node. We would call add node type, and we'd say the cart node. 
Now the cart node, it takes, it has some outputs and those outputs are going to be um, one of these ports. So we have two ports here, the cart sum and the number of items. Um, so let's add another node here. We'll add the add numbers node. And this one, it takes in some input. So it takes in two number ports, a number one and a number two. And it also has outputs. It has one output and it will output a result, which is going to be the numbers added together. So this is great. We've modeled this. Uh, we've, we've created a configuration for this node editor, what it should look like. But we actually want to run it. We don't want to just model it and have that for like planning or documentation purposes. We actually want to run it. That's where the Flume engine comes in. This is also very simple to write. Um, this is essentially just a switch statement where you come through um, and we can look at a case for every, uh, every node type. So in this case, we have the multiply numbers node. Very simple, we just look for the multiply, number, no, multiply numbers node ID, its type, and then we return a result, which is the output node, or the, excuse me, the output port, where it takes in its two input values and it knows how to transform them together, in this case, multiply them. We can have a user node, for example, that it just knows how to output certain attributes of the user, in this case, three strings and one that's a, a state, like the US state that they live in. Um, what's interesting about this one is, is the engine itself doesn't need to know anything about where this user com comes from. Does it come from Redux, local storage, a database, anything like that? It just gets it out of context. That's important because when we write this Flume engine, we don't want it to be dependent on any of its surrounding environment. We want to be totally independent of that. Um, we refer to that as context independency, where we'll, we'll just pass in the context that this engine is going to need in order to run at runtime. Um, to explain that, here's an example where we want to use our, our new Flume engine that we've built. We want to use that inside of just a React component. This could be that checkout. So all we're going to do here is we're going to import this use root engine uh, hook. And by the way, you don't have to use Flume with React. Um, it's, it's totally optional, but it does ship with a handy React hook to make it easy to do. So you can see we're going to get back here a total, a tax rate, and an is tax exempt, which are the three attributes of the root node of our graph. These are the things that we want to get back out of our graph once we calculate the whole thing. And to do that, we need to pass in some context. So we, need, we needed that uh, to know what the cart was, what the user was, and what the current date was. Those are things that are specific to the environment that we're in, where you know we're probably on the front end here, writing a React component. That user is probably coming from you know maybe a Redux store, and the cart might be coming from local storage, perhaps, something like that. We're going to pass that into the engine so that it has that information available when it needs it. And that's it. Um, on every render, it will just rerun that engine. It'll give us back those variables, and then we can just use those below to render out that checkout. Now, the great thing about writing it this way is we can actually also use this exact same engine without changing a single line of it. We can use it in, you know, say a node server, for example. So this is a pretty typical express route where we have a get route for slash checkout, um, where we want it to return a total, a tax rate, and whether or not the user was tax exempt. So all we need to do here is we'll get our nodes out of our database, that JSON graph that we'd already stored somewhere, and we'll just import that same engine file. And you know you could you could store this file in its own library to share between your front end and your back end, however you want to share that, but you can import the exact same code. We have that engine. We'll just call resolve root node, pass in those nodes, and we get back those exact same attributes. But of course, the context of this environment is a little bit different, where this user and the cart and the, and the, the current date, those might come from different sources. They might come from the database rather than a Redux store, something like that. 
And because we've written our engine this way, that doesn't matter. We can just pull our cart and our user straight out of the database. And now we can run this, uh, this engine in an entirely new environment. And it's going to run exactly the same. Our logic is now purely portable between entirely different environments. So in the end here, we've created the ability to share our logic between the front end and the back end. We've made sure that that logic is fully context independent. So it doesn't, it doesn't rely on its surrounding environment. It's supplied to it when it needs it. Our application logic is now separate from our user's business logic. So the business logic can be held in these, these JSON graphs that we store in a database and the application logic, the capabilities are stored in the code. And now because we have these JSON graphs in our database, our users are only downloading the logic that they need. Um, not everybody's, just for those particular users. And we've also created a way for non-coders in our organization to implement logic. And I think that that's the most powerful part about this, is um, whoever your users are, it might be internal users, it could even be end users. Um, this. Uh, there are some apps that are running Flume that are aimed at end users, and end users are capable, in many cases, of doing this kind of logic themselves. But even if it's something that you use as an internal tool, it's something that you can use to enable the people in your organization who are their logical thinkers, they're good at figuring out what is the business logic that people need, and they just need the capability to write that logic in a way that they know how to do. They can't write JavaScript, but you can create this programming language for them, this visual language, where they can go in themselves, set up that business logic, your developers don't even need to be involved, um, and you've enabled a lot more people to be involved in this kind of work. So if you want to learn more about Flume, I have a website for it, it's called flume.dev. It looks like this. It's basically, I, I've tried to make it as simple as possible to get started, there um, should be some fairly robust documentation. If there are things that you are confused about, please reach out to me on Twitter, um, at Chris J. Patty, right there. I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for your time.